with us on this journey, on this life-changing event. And it's not just life-changing for my family, but it's life-changing for this whole church. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? So, Father, we pray that you'll be in the midst of everything that we do, that you will walk with us, before us, beside us, and behind us, guide our steps, and help us to worship you the way that you have called us to worship you. In the name of Jesus.
is going to be a weird service. I'm just going to tell you now. Rather than let you find out on your own, it's going to be a different service. Um, we are going to take communion this morning. But as I was praying and preparing, as I got to the end of the week, I felt like it was important to talk about communion in the way that I see it. And so this morning I'm going to preach on communion. Next week I'm going to be preaching a I'm going to tell you, the Lord gave me a word for you before I would, before a letter was read in your church that I was coming. The Lord gave me a word for you, so come back next week. I'm going to be preaching something, uh, preaching a word called unconsumed. But this morning, as we take time to come together, I want to talk about communion, the importance of it biblically, what it means for us in the church, where it comes from, because what we need to understand is that everything we do in the church comes from a Jewish tradition. As well, so I want to show you that this morning. And so, the Lord's Supper, what it does is, it identifies us with the crucifixion of Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I believe we all need to understand. We serve a God that never asks us to do something He Himself would not do. If you look throughout Scripture, every single thing God Almighty asks us to do, He did Himself. Look at baptism. We talk about believers' baptism. Jesus Christ Himself was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. Jesus tells us to love our neighbor. Jesus loved all His neighbors. Jesus tells us to do the Lord's Supper as He Himself takes part in it. So God never asks us to do anything that he himself would not do. So if you want to turn with me this morning in your Bibles, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 22, verse 14. Luke chapter 22, verse 14. The verses are going to be on the screen as well. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 14, And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I sat. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also, the cup after supper said, This cup is the new statement in my blood, which is shed for you. You bow your heads. Let's pray before this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the Holy Word. We thank you, Lord, that your spirit is still living and breathing among us, God, and you still bring fresh interpretation, God, to word that was written thousands of years ago. I pray, Lord God, that as I preach this morning, God, Lord, I would fade into the background, but your spirit would come forth out of me, Father God. Lord, that you would work with these lips of clay, God, and let only what needs to be said, only what needs to be done, in the Holy Ghost be done this morning. In your holy name, amen. So in the text, Jesus and his apostles are gathering together to celebrate the Feast of Passover, which was a remembrance and a celebration of when God commanded the children of Israel to place the blood upon the doorposts, buckle their sandals, and get ready to go. Because when God tells them to eat it, he says, don't take off your sandals. He even tells them to keep your rods and your staffs in your hand. Staffs in your hand. You need to be ready to go. Now, God is not a God of waste. And I need you to understand this. God is still a God of the Jews. The Jewish people still serve the God we serve. The festivals that we recognize in the Christian church and we celebrate... They're derived from the festivals of the Jewish calendar. The festival of Passover became to us the celebration of Easter. The festival of Pentecost, which was a remembrance of the law being given to Moses on Mount Sinai, we fast forward to Acts chapter 2, and it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church. The fest Feast of Trumpets, which begins 10 days of consecration before the Lord and led to the Day of Atonement, that festival was not found in the Christian church quite Because that festival will signify the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
God's calendar, and what I love is if you look at the Jewish calendar and the Gregorian calendar, they're, they're completely different. But if you look at the Jewish calendar and the way God works, God works within that calendar scheme. And so it's important for us to understand this. So I believe to fully understand where we're headed as a church and the church as a general, you have to understand where you came from. So if we want to understand communion, if we want to understand Pentecost, if we want to understand Christ in general, we need to understand the context of where Christ came from, what Christ did. And so in Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, it says, As we look back at the night of the Passover, God gave the Israelites a specific command about the bread they were to eat that night. They were to make it without yeast. Now I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you I, we did this last Sunday with, with uh, unleavened bread. I'm going to tell you, I like bread. <laughs> um, and I mean, I don't know, I've mean, got a Texas Bread House and Roll. My wife and I had Texas Bread House. Who doesn't love a good old Texas Bread House Roll with honey butter? Can I get an amen on that one? I mean, that's good bread. Communion with Texas Bread House Rolls, I mean, <laughs> praise God if you fill the church up. Amen. But God does not do that simply to take away the joy of bread. There's a reason God commanded the children of Israel to bake bread, bake bread without yeast. It's because bread without yeast is quicker to bake. My wife's grandmother has a roll recipe that they make every Thanksgiving, and they have to start it about three days before Thanksgiving. Because they have to get the dough time to rise, get the dough time to do what it needs to so they can bake it. But in this moment, we talked about the urgency. Don't unbuckle your sandals, eat with your staff. They had to be ready when God said to move. So God tells them to not bake their bread with yeast, but rather bake unleavened bread, because it was quick and they needed to be ready to go. And in Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Church, sometimes we can miss what God is doing because we don't make haste when God tells us to do something. We choose to wait back. We choose to lollygag. We choose to hold on. But when God says go, it's time to go. And I recognize that in my own mind. God was about to deliver these people. And if they were not ready, when God said go, they would have missed it. If we look at the timing, and it's amazing how God's timing works. If we look at the timing, they get to the Red Sea at the perfect time, and the Red Sea parts that they're able to cross, if they would have baked with yeast, or if they would have had to wait for somebody to put their shoes on, or grab their staff, Pharaoh would have been able to easily catch up with them. But because they were ready to go, when God said go, they were able to escape the perils of so when God says go, or when God says be ready, we have to be ready, and we have to be willing to go. Now, the most significant part of the Passover feast is the blood. And in Exodus chapter twelve, verse thirteen, and the blood and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood. I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So the blood was a sign of the people of God. Where the blood was in present, judgment passed over. In Hebrews 9 22, and almost all things by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Sins. Blood is necessary. And so when the Hebrews sacrificed these lambs and they put the blood upon their doorposts, it showed God that they had sought forgiveness for their sins while the Egyptians were still living in their sin. Therefore, whenever they put the blood on the doorposts, the angel of death passed over. But it struck the Egyptian family. Israel marked their separation from Egypt as God's people with the blood just as our separation from the world is marked with the blood. 
The blood is not a visible thing to mankind. However, there is evidence that should be visible. You should not have to walk around and tell everybody you're saved for them to know you're saved. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. The Bible talks about in Galatians that there are fruits of the Spirit. If you are lacking, I, I, I'll, I'll talk to people and then I'll be like, well, this person is just not lacking. There's just no fruit there. And so they begin to question salvation. If you don't have fruit, how are you showing that you are of the vine? How are you showing that are you, you are of God if you're not producing this? So the blood's not visible, but it is providing evidence. When the blood is applied, there is a change in us. Are we made new? Can the world tell us apart? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, and if you want to turn with me real quick there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, I forgot to mark this one. I'm just going to apologize. The word says, Oh, wherefore come out from among them and be you separate, saying the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will see. So the blood sets us apart. The blood helps us become new. You know, uh, Pastor Travis Hall of Life Church, he wrote a book called Seven Deadly Thoughts. And he talked about how sometimes as Christians, we can be so focused on the outside, and the inside can be a complete mess. Now, I'm not going to do this, because I don't, I, you know, I'm a germaphobe. But if there's a bowl that's dirty on the outside, I can pour milk and cereal in it, and I can eat that cereal. Now, if my wife, my wife had pesto chicken a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was, you know, if you've ever used pesto, it is all over that bowl. So if I, if I eat that and I put the whole, I put the cabinet, when I make my frosted place the next morning, it's going to taste like pesto frost flakes, and, and that, that's not actually going to be good. So we, 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 felt we, we as Christians, we can focus on the outside, but we, what we need to understand is that the blood is an inside work. The blood is an inside work that pours over into the outside. Whenever, it, whenever people get saved, they may be living in sin, they may be, you know, with drunkenness, they may be in fornication, they may be uh, addicted to drugs, they may be addicted to porn. That doesn't technically go away. But what happens is God gets on the inside and God begins to clean up the inside and they begin to no longer want to do these things. They begin to say, hold on, this doesn't feel as good as it used to. Hold on, this doesn't feel just right. Hold on, I can't stand when I do this. And as God begins to do that, as they begin to go through this process called sanctification, they begin on the outside. They begin on the outside to appear and to live and to act as a Christian. Being, being sanctified is not wearing a dress down to your head down to your toes with your hair all the way down your back, no jewelry, no makeup, nothing. That's not holiness. That's not sanctification. But let me tell you what it is. It's producing fruit. It's living for God. It's choosing the things of this world, choosing the things of God as opposed to the things of this world. Amen. And it's an inside work. The blood is an inside work that works its way to the outside. And there's symbolism. All these festivals and celebrations, they use symbolism and imagery to represent what was taking place in the supernatural. Using baptism. You go under the water as, as if your sinful self is being dead and buried. And you come up as a new person in Christ. If we look back at the scriptures, Christ stated that the bread represents his body. Christ breaks the bread before he passes it over. There was a communal piece of bread or a loaf that all the disciples were eating. And as it is passed around, the bread is torn. As Jesus knows, his body will be in the days to come. I filled in my buddy is in the Methodist church. And back in 2019, he called me as a hangman. He'd be compelling for him. 
And so I went, and they did communion that morning. And you had to walk up to the table, and you had to tear off the bread and dip it in the juice. It was just such a unique experience. Brother Ernest was telling me the other day, we were talking about communion, that he was a deacon in the church. And he said that the pastor had ripped off the top of the bread and he poured the juice in and he began to cut the bread. And as he cut the bread, it began to bleed out. There's symbolism in what we do. And here's what I need you to understand. Symbolism doesn't save you. The symbolism is there to help us understand what's going on in the supernatural. In the book of Hebrews, I can't remember the verse exactly. But it talks about how the tabernacle were types and shadows of what was taking place in heaven. And that's what these things we do are. The Lord suffered. That these are all representations of what's taking place in the supernatural. The blood was represented by the wine. We use juice today. It's not church time, but we do. His blood would be poured out over the next couple of days. So much so that when they pierce his side to ensure that he's dead, he bleeds out fire. With very little fire. His blood was the necessary sacrifice for the remission of sins. If we look back at the Exodus, there were specific requirements for the lambs that would be sacrificed and their blood put upon the doorposts. In Exodus 12, 5, it says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the blood shall be upon you to destroy you when I smite the Lord. The lamb must have been spot, without spot or wrinkle, which in our case would be without sin. And Jesus, is the only human ever able to live a sinless, perfect life. A human man living 33 years without committing a single sin is wrong. And was the end all be all sacrifice. I can barely go three days without doing something stupid. But Jesus Christ made it 33 years. And he took a punishment that if, we, if we're honest, we deserve. It should have been us on that cross. We should have been nailed to that cross. We should have been beaten. We should have been torn. But Jesus said, no, I'll take it. Now, I always talk about this. Uh, you know, North Rome Church of God used to be the passion play. And I remember sitting, sitting in the audience and you see Jesus. And you see him on that cross and he's just looking back. And as Jesus dies, they play, he looks me on my faults. And I think... That as the crowd of people standing around him, he looks beyond that crowd and he sees us in 2023 sitting at New Life Church of God. He sees wherever, he sees all the church today and he knows, I must do this. Not only for the people at the foot of the cross, but those that are coming behind me. Those in 33 AD, 43 AD, 53 AD, 1733, 18, all these Christians. I must do this for those that wish to serve me so they can have eternal life with me and my Father. Christ did what no lamb, ram, goat, or bull could ever do. He shed blood for mankind for all eternity. The sacrifice never needs to be repeated. Now let me explain what I mean there. I believe in praying forgiveness regularly. I don't believe that whenever I knelt down and, and prayed for forgiveness, that all my sins were... I believe that they were all washed away, but I believe I made mistakes after I prayed. I believe that's what it is. All my sins were washed away, but I'm going to tell you I've sinned since I got saved. If I told you I didn't, my wife would slap me, then my mom would come up right behind her and slap me. I've sinned since I got saved. And I believe people can walk away from that salvation. Because they choose not to submit their lives to an almighty God. They no longer feel they need God. They no longer seek the forgiveness of God. So I believe you can backslide. But 
But the sacrifice doesn't need to be related because it's still there. He's still there. All you got to do is ask him. But the prodigal son thought, I forgive you, but he can take me back. And I can tell you, according to the word of God, he's going to say yes. Hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is doing a lot of teaching and disciplining, trying to help the church at Corinth be holy and accepted. And in chapter 11, he begins to dive into the story of the Last Supper, as well as the process of partaking in it. And we're going to be in chapter 11, verse 27, if you want to turn. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. What does it mean by unworthily taking part in the Lord's Supper? I've got these questions for you. Are we, as we examine ourselves this morning, as we prepare to take part in the Lord's Supper, are we living a life glorified by Christ? Are we saved? We all sin and we all make mistakes. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. Otherwise, if we're not working towards attaining Christ. We're dishonoring the name. He's looking for genuine followers of Christ to be a part of us. Do we walk in church one way and we are completely different when we walk out into the world? Do we come and grab some forgiveness on Sunday morning just to help us make it through the week? Some I've heard pastors call it, do we just come on Sunday morning to get some fire insurance? Or are we doing the best that we can to obey God and live in His will. Paul even states that we, as Christians, should examine ourselves. The blood is there as a cover, so that when God sees us, He sees His Son. Before we partake of communion, we, we need to make sure that we are washed and covered in the blood of Jesus. That is what the blood says. In verse 29, For He... That eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sin. The legalism of the church has made this verse very hard for us to swallow. And I believe it's even deterred some Christians from partaking in communion. Because if you don't feel like you're perfect, it's hard to take communion. Can I get an amen? I had a pastor I, I was working for at the time. He said, you can hear me now. I looked and said, well, you ever feel unworthy when you get up there to look at me? He said, all the time. All the time. But I believe it's a good sign that we examine ourselves and we recognize that compared to Christ, we fall short. Oh, we fall off scripture. This verse is not meant to deter us as Christians from partaking in communion but to help us understand the seriousness of what this represents. There were Corinthians who were facing consequences of partaking unworthily, but if you look at the whole book of Corinthians, they had a lot of problems. There was sin and chaos running throughout that church. They didn't simply make a mistake or have a hard week, and God punished them for partaking in communion. It was people who were living, the, who were not living the Christian life or not showing reverence for the sacrament. The Bible, whenever Paul talks to him, he says, don't come in and gorge yourself on wine and bread and be drunken. That's not what communion is about. It's about remembering the sacrifice. If you're living as a Christian to the best of your ability and are not a Christian only when you walk through these doors, then partake. This verse isn't meant to scare us to the point where we don't want to take communion. Otherwise, it would almost, we almost be do if you do, do if you don't. But Christ commands us to take part of this. Christ commands us to do this in remembrance of Him. And as we finish looking at this portion of 1 Corinthians, it should be very obvious that communion is for believers only. There are some churches, and I've been to those, where they say you must be a member of our church to partake in communion. And I attended one of those. And I was not a member, and so they brought the communion around us. And my brother said, I don't care. He took the communion and did it anyway. But I felt so left out of the body of Christ at that point. 
And I'm very proud of our denomination because at the last General Assembly, they changed the wording in the minutes to be anybody who is a part of the body of Christ may partake. Before, I'm a, before we have a moment of, of altar and prayer before that's up, there's a fellowship aspect. And this is why we're doing the community today. Um, Pastor Allison and I is for Sunday. We've seen throughout the scripture where people came together to take the Passover. And today in the Christian church, we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper or communion. Now, the definition of communion is the sharing or exchange of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. So although throughout this process it's quiet and we're not talking to each other, this is a very intimate moment. Not only between us and Christ personally, but between us as believers as we identify together with the sacrifice of Christ. Well, Tony, you come up here and eat this music. This moment not only brings us closer to our Creator and Savior, but it also allows us to develop a closer relationship with each other as we take a moment in unity to point our eyes towards the cross of Jesus and the sacrifice He made. There's something that happens when we set our eyes on Jesus together. In Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. When the believers in the book of Acts were all in one accord, and one mindset, the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the church. What great things would happen if we were able to shake our thoughts and minds all together on Him for just a few moments? Can you stand up all the I love you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you a very serious question. Do you know Jesus. As we prepare to take a take part and we you know we, we share in the sacrifice of Christ, I ask you, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know that He lived a life servant to God and that He died on the cross for our sins? Are you here this morning and maybe you said, Pastor, I knew Jesus at the Lord. But I walked away, I don't live for him like I should. And I want to rededicate my life to Him. If you want to rededicate your life or if you want to follow the Lord in salvation this morning, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm just going to ask you to lift up your hand and we're all praying. If you slip up your hand, we pray with you. Actually, let's all pray. Lord, we believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ. To come and die for our sins on the cross that we deserved. And I pray that this morning, those that have slipped up their hands would receive you. And so if you slipped up your hand, I want you to repeat after me. Father, Father, I am a sinner. I've done wrong. And I pray that you would forgive me. I believe that you sent your Son. Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. And I choose today, today, to live a holy life seeking after you. I may not be perfect. I may make mistakes. But I will submit myself to you and continue working on following me. Forgive me my past transgressions. And help me to walk towards you. Good to me. And search me. And see if there be any evil way in me. In your holy name. Thank you, Brother Tony. You may be seated. My wife and I, we 
anything unrelated in Russia can do that. So we're going to take some time to reflect. Brother Ernest and Brother Josh, can you pass out the elements? Can we just take a minute in reverence of what we're about to do and ask God to cleanse us, give us of our sins, wash us from us, and then pray how you need to. I'm going to say a prayer, but I can't pray for a couple of Lord, as we come to And I'll 
านนี้ครับนนอได้ Jesus was betrayed and took the bread and he broke it. And I would invite you to dig it in, in the juice and say, look at it. But he took it, he broke it, and he said, take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. So go ahead and take the bread. And when he had taken the bread, he took up the cup. And he said, this one is the testament that represents my blood, which is shed for you. And he took the cup and he drank. <laughs> and in Matthew, chapter 26, 40, as we prepare to end the service, it says that as they left, they, uh, they say to him, so I, uh, I, I, I hope you know this one, and I, I hope that you'll sing it with me. Draw me